Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining Analytic Stories. I've got Ray Vela with me today, and I'm very happy to have him. We've known each other for quite some time, so this is going to be a great session. Before we jump in, just a couple of quick items. This is being recorded, so you'll have plenty of opportunities to come back and listen to this and share it with your friends. And also, we're not going to be doing Q&A during this time, but if you have any questions, please leave them below the video section here, and Ray and I will do our best to get to them after the uh, event is done. So, Ray, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad you're here. One day we'll get to see each other in person again. Yeah. yeah. Besides Thanks. doing it this way. Thanks, too. So, so let's, let's get right to it. Now, you have worked, I know, with some amazing data over your career. And like many of us, the data always doesn't tell good news. And you're, you're literally working with the news versus, you know, did our profits go up, did our yeah. sales go up kind of thing. Yeah. So can you share a time when the story that you were working with that made you personally uncomfortable and you really you really didn't want to publish it, but of course you had to publish it. So how, yeah. what was that story? How did you handle the situation? <clears throat> and then what did you learn about delivering bad news that you used in the future? Mm -hmm. There's kind of a three-parter in there. Yeah, wow. What an interesting question. Um, and is this unique to, to me or is this the question that you ask all of your guests. Well, everybody gets a different version of the com what I call the comfort zone. Really, really. Okay, fascinating. So let me just give um, people a little bit of a, a quick background. Um, I started out uh, at Gannett, uh, Ghana, and uh, that was a newspaper chain, the largest at the time, and, and they held USA Today. So I started out doing those um, informational graphics on the front cover. Um, and I went from Rochester, New York, where Mr. Gannett was from, that was the world headquarters, down to um, USA Today in Washington, DC. So that was um, a nosebleed, honestly. Uh, so then, you know, really break, break and cutting my teeth on that um, sort of work. And that was um, the subject matter was uh, very eclectic, of course. It was uh, news, good and bad, um, sure. business also. And then um, Washington, D.C. was too hot for me at the time. Um, I came from a very northern climate. So I went on to Business Week magazine and worked uh, many years there, businessweekmagazine.com TV. So, so eventually the economic and financial data uh, began to be um, really what I sort of specialized in. I mean, just um, it was a great career, the best education of my life. Uh, Michael Bloomberg bought it, and then I uh, was brought over there. Um, and then uh, went to MasterCard uh, corporate um, briefly. So that was economic as well as tech. So mm -hmm. that seems to be where I enjoy myself um, the most. Um, and the humanities as well. Um, but, you know, it's like trying to bring a human story element to all of these uh, information data sets. Really, really, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so then from there, now I work at the Conference Board, which is a bipartisan economic think tank that have done, let's say I do uh, work on the Consumer Confidence Index, um, economic indices, which you may have heard of, and also uh, one leg of the organization um, is based, was created out of the White House and it's a center for economic development. That's really, really fascinating, especially at this time. And they have been responsible, they were responsible for creating the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe and Asia after World War II. So now they're working on a new Marshall Plan for small business. Oh. So, okay. Great. So I need that. Yeah, Great. right? Great. Right, right. We all do. Um, to save Main Street, really. 
So, so that said, um, you know, this is a really interesting question and I would go back to probably business week where I had to cover, you know, events such as, uh, we all did, um, cover story on, of course, on nine 11. Oh, and so, uh, it's current and, and, you know, still relevant, you know, to most of us. So I'll just elaborate on that. And so, of course, that information, all the data and information that went with that was difficult. But um, then the invasion of Iraq. So then, you know, Business Week is economic, but news. And right. so, of course, that, you know, took, you know, us all by surprise. And so doing that sort of content, and at the time we were global, of course, all over the world, Business Week, Russia, China, um, everywhere in the world. And so we had, oh, uh, we had, you know, editors and writers in tanks and on the ground in Iraq, oh. you know, reporting. Wow. Um, but if I go back just off the top of my head, if I think of, of you know, what was the most uncomfortable was that I was tasked with doing a map one evening. Um, and we worked late and I worked in Rockefeller Center and up on the 43rd floor. So so we worked after the stock market closed. But one evening I was tasked to develop a map, as it turns out, which is really a diagram, right? Um, a, in it of events. And that was based around the nuclear backpack, the possibility. Oh. So while well, offhand it doesn't, you know, it's sort of behind us, it's still relevant because it's still a scary thought. But it was terrifying at the time. And so I had to bring all of the information gathered at that time. Um, and everything was unknown and you know Every day was a learning experience of what was coming out of an invasion and, you know, the collapse of the World Trade Centers. And, but this map was on the nuclear backpack and, and the hot spots where this could potentially happen and where the focus was. And that was pretty much at the base of the building. So a nuclear backpack, you mean literally somebody carrying like a nuclear yeah. bomb in a backpack? Yeah. Yes, the dirty bomb. And But what would be right down on street level. So I'm doing a informational graphic on, on the hot zone, and I'm sitting in the hot zone. Right, you're 43 right. stories up. Yeah, so, you know, but just being in Rockefeller Center, it was just like the intensity of that was frightening. And so then, you know, I have to, we're going to publish this globally, worldwide, and tell everybody exactly where we are. <laughs> right? So th that's that's what comes to mind. That was a, a terrifying time. And uh, going home at night was, you know, just, you know, the military in the streets and, you know, submachine guns, and I mean, you have to like put it in perspective of being there at that time, yeah. and all unknown. You know that could occur, and there. So were, when you, so when they gave you that assignment, did it occur to you that it was going to have that kind of effect? You know, right? Or did you? It was only after you started really thinking about it and yeah. realizing, wait a second, I'm writing this. Yeah this story uh, yeah. at, you know, where you are and what the times are and you know, yeah. it started to really shape, shape up more. It seemed to be minute by minute, you know, like life was unfolding in a new way that we had never really thought about, mm. honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm sure other people did, of course, um, people in security and, you know, NYPD was um, incredible, but it was just terrifying. So there was, you know, a daily event of possibility of things mm -hmm. that are going to occur. And, you know, the temperature was really hot at the time. So, you know, just 
thinking off the top of my head, the consequence of doing that sort of an informational graphic, telling that story and where all the hotspots were sent, that time, of course, you can't. We have detectors all over the right. year. Right, harder to, to, to get into those zones. Yeah. So now, as you were going going through that, was there a discussion with the the editorial team that these issues were coming up, and 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 almost even how you you and the team were feeling about this, or was it just kind of more matter of fact? Because I'm curious what you could what we could kind of take away from dealing with something that's so intense. I mean, that's much more intense than most of us would have to deal with. But if we could take away some notion of that feeling and how you how it was handled, I think that could be that's pretty valuable to us. Live in the moment, you know. I mean, that was a really um, good way to. I had worked in the news, of course, prior and and business news for still so many years. But in the end of the day, you just have to live in the moment and and uh feel thankful and that there were so many people that were there if you know uh, uh something were to arise uh of course we didn't have the security in place at the time at the time that we do now when you right in the building and you know none of that was there so you know i don't think that i could imagine other than you know you're on a day-to-day level, you your mind sort of can wander, and it was frightening. So I, I just it was terrifying, but we had to do it. And I guess the the best thing is that we just worked through it. Uh, to as a team, right? Yeah, as a team, and you know, did um, you know? It wasn't just that graphic alone, but it was just you know on that theme, which was. You know why they came down and what the story was behind it. And in fact, I'll tell you, I actually, uh, having been in the news, I, I business, I, I actually kept a time capsule, which I still have, mm, mm-hmm. and and I mean literally and sealed in my in storage, and of all of the periodicals and all of the coverage from the day 9-11 and I retrieved what I could at the time and I have all of those documents and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, towards maybe the end of my career or something um, to donate that to um, an educational facility. And I have never, you know, reopened that, but that is, they are sealed documents. Wow. Yeah, right. I just, I, you know, I just thought of that. Um, and it was all of the periodicals at that time. And, and so some of it was, of course, sifted through and was different than we had thought about. And or Colin Powell had, you know, imagined that what had happened in the CIA and being in Libya. So it was a very complicated story. But for whatever reason, I guess at the time I just um, prepared a, a, a tub of, <laughs> to collect, you know, the, the events of the time. Maybe that would be, maybe that'd be an interesting thing for people to do when they make some kind of big business decision is to uh, do something similar and look back on it years later and maybe put it in a different context oh, of, yeah. of that, you know, I, it's a, you know, cause school kids do it all the time, right? My kids did it and they, they build these time capsules and they, did they? you know, yeah, yeah. We you know, bury them in different places and yeah. you know, hope somebody finds it a hundred years later that, you know, yeah. when, they, when they, when they dig it up. All right. So let's move on that. Now that was very intense, but I want to move on to something yeah. that maybe will be a little bit more lighthearted. And yeah. I think this fits because you also said that when you move, you, you prefer to be maybe in a little bit of a colder climate than something like D.C. So imagine, so imagine you're in the mountains. Now, Ray and I are both uh, 
bicyclist. So imagine you're you're riding in the mountains now. We're going to sh really shift gears. Uh, no, no pun intended with that one. So yeah. we're in the mountains, and you you come across an amazing waterfall, and it's kind of you get out and you stop and you, you're looking around. You've never seen this one before, and you you happen to notice a sign. It says "Make a wish," which is kind of strange. Uh, so you decide to play along. And if you were to make a wish, what is a behavior? I want you to focus on that word. What's a behavior that you wish people who are either data illustrators, visualization practitioners, what behavior do you would you wish that they would change that you think would make a really big impact on their careers? Hmm. Interesting. It's great. And it's wild. I just have, I have this on my desk. It is a notebook. And to document your thoughts. Mm. That is fairly easy for me to, to, to really add answer to. Um, so I keep a, a journal since, since I was in college. So I have these back to back in a timeline of sorts. Um, and, you know, I didn't really set out to do that, uh, you know, but that's what we're told in school. And I, I don't think I actually did it in school, but from the time that I went out into the workforce and I had to think of my, I was tasked with always thinking of concepts to bring a visual story with information, data, and and all sorts of information. I was always my responsibility to merge that. If you go back to um, USA Today, which was at the time groundbreaking in that sense of delivering uh, a quick and concise message. Sure. How do you get to that? Is you, you know, you have to explore, give yourself time to push things around and you know, to collect all your information. And I have a little um, diagram I work off of, and it's um, understand the information. And what's the message you want to say? Mm -hmm. And who's the audience? And yeah. If you answer those three things. And so you can't possibly collect. We're busy. Everybody's busy. There's, you know, your, your world, your own personal world, laundry kids, blah, blah, blah. And then there's our world, world at work, and then there's the rest of the world, right? Like people in, you know, Thailand and people in the UK and in South Africa. And so, you know, when you're working in this field, you have to, you know, distinguish who, who is your audience with this particular piece. So all of that sort of becomes clarified as you... Um, start to write down the different components and put that together to create. Yeah. I like that because, well, one, I think a lot of what we do is we kind of said, oh, I need an idea. And then I just, they just, right. Do it. And there's no kind of, I don't you know, uh, letting it just kind of sit and simmer a bit. Yeah. So that, that's, I think that, 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 pressure of time i think is so that's that's one problem and i do i i feel that when i write things down because we're so used to just being on a computer now yeah. and yeah. the tools are there right whether you're drawing or you're doing some kind of charts or dashboards or visual stories right it's just oh let me just jump in and and play around with my mouse and drag things around and yeah. at least for me that 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 act of writing somehow brings out more you know i just guess it's some kind of connection the brain, way the brain works i don't know i just that's what i find so i i i i, I like that idea but the I, other thing that you said about audience i think is really critical because you've a lot of your work has been for a a, a, a very diverse audience right if you're right. writing for usa today but right you know all kinds of people are are picking that up and right. so how do what's something that we could learn from that because i find that that's a huge problem is that we do 
tend to, and I don't agree with this, but I think people tend to try to create something that is, oh, this is for everybody, right? I'll make this visual and it's for the CEO and it's for my peers and it's for the person in marketing and it's also for the sales team. And that doesn't really work. Uh, and I don't know if you have anything you can share with us about how do you how do you make sure you don't fall into a trap of trying to make, you know, of fo really focusing on your audience? Yeah. Um, so if I consider myself of average intelligence, and if I can understand this, if I can walk away and understand this graphic, um, most people would be able to. But then... You know, of course, you want to distinguish, is this graphic made for somebody in the steel industry? Is it, you know, like you can use visual cues to entice a reader. Of like your, what? What's a visual? What does that actually mean? Well, I don't know. Like, does that mean like a factory, um, you know, steel as opposed to you know, somebody working at IBM and, mm -hmm. you know, so like there's just think about things visually, I guess, you know, I've like done this my whole life. So, and you know, an artist, uh, I'm an illustrator by trade. So, but with communications, uh, uh, concentration as well. And so I went to Syracuse university, which is a good illustration program. And of course, the school of Newhouse, which is journalism. Mm -hmm. And I was genuinely interested in those worlds, sort of the combination. And so communication was whatever that may be now is like, you know, a big movement in social media. So you have to understand that vehicle then to get to that audience. And so, you know, if you're talking about you know, the steel industry, that's not going to be relatable to somebody in the fashion industry, mm -hmm. distributing clothes um, for polo or, you know, right. or, you know, because that's like a huge industry in itself. But still, you got to make it relatable in some way to them by using visual cues, which is a I call visual language or iconography of some sort, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. to arrange the data so that it is in the shape of, or there's all sorts of possibilities. And that's where, you know, I think you just got to let your mind wander and yeah. give yourself some time to do a, a communication arts many years ago called it ideation. So it's, you know, conceptual development. And so think about like the data. If you're talking to somebody in the Wall Street, sector right mm -hmm. so you know n numbers are are important but don't make the story hard to get to try not to you know try to sift through it and and point out the anomaly rather quickly and i do like a weekly graphic on um the conference board on our uh, uh website and it's on COVID 19. Oh. and the uh, pandemic and that's a fact on the economy and corporations and it's very complicated you know like uh it's on the consumer confidence um the economic outlook for 2021 so all of these organizations not all of them but you know many get their um data from us so if i just make that very engaged very easy to understand and mm -hmm. that is without visual decoration you know that has to it's really on its own it's statistical analytical statistical Which is and tough, so tough. I think, yeah, yeah i have to slow it down i i i often think of it as work like the fbi hurry up to slow it down mm. and and so that you want to just slow this down and take out re redundancies and, and uh, information that doesn't need to be, and especially when you're doing something statistical. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you want to simplify it down, especially for the broader audience. 
Yeah. So let me let me ask you before I jump because I, I have a good this is a good lead to the final thing I want to ask you about. But do you have a, a preferred journal that you like to write in? Is there you know, do you have a particular type of notebook that you like to use? I'm just curious. I do. I do. Um, this is a yes, they're moleskin. Oh yeah. They're no, you know, re renowned. Um, I, I think you know many writers and artists have used sure. this. Work. But um, yeah, it's just a comfortable size. I was always able to carry it in my backpack, not the nuclear backpack, but my <laughs> own backpack on the way to work. And it just travels easy. And, you know, I've always put my first address, contact information, if I ever lost it, if I left it on the train, which never occurred, thank God. But, um, yeah, thank goodness. But, yeah, so there's, a question, there's a question coming in. I just want to read this one off. Uh, do you publish your visuals on Instagram or somewhere else? Okay, well, I do leverage um, weekly. I leverage my content up on LinkedIn. So if you follow me, you know, connect with me, please. It's um, uh, Lee can post that up, you know, right after class, but my LinkedIn, and please connect and then, you know, to follow someone. And then we do uh, uh, myself and Jonathan Liu, who is who I work with, and um, enable he creates animations. I, I actually lay out the animation as I see it. I break my graphic once it's done, then I dissect it and think about how it would be cool as an animation. And so yeah. Jonathan is a social media guru and he posts that out there. Very cool. Uh, Twitter and LinkedIn and um, I think Instagram too, but I, I, you know, and maybe Facebook, um, wherever we are, you know, that's where he posts it. But I always repost uh, pretty much every week. I know last week's graphic got, you know, 120 views, something else I just did recently, you know, got over 300 views. So, you know, yeah. I have a pretty good sized network. Um, and, but that's just, you know, people viewing it. I mean, you know, Jonathan is posting in all it's of everywhere. The, yeah, no, that's it, good. I it, think people should. It's good to see other people's work like that. The one, the one idea I want to plant with with folks is also. Well, I will. We'll go into this last question. Is that the other value of of keeping a notebook like that is to go back into the, the notebook and maybe bring out ideas that you had before. So it's always just good to to kind of track that. So speaking of notebooks, is that you, you talked about you didn't keep a notebook really when you were in school. But um, for, for folks that you know have seen your bio now, they they know that you've also been teaching. So not only do you do all this work in the corporate side, but you've been teaching at Yeshiva University, Columbia, NYU, and really helping share all that knowledge you have. So besides telling students to keep a notebook, what's the, on the first class of the semester, what's something that you tell them about that they should be doing, you know, right away, the, once they leave the classroom back at work, what's something that they could be doing? Hmm. That first class, which was only a week ago. Um, okay, so it should be fresh. Yeah, wow, right. So... So what would that be other than, you know, to build some structure? And, and I am, like, have sometimes no structure in my life, right? I just, so, but I am highly structured in what I do. Um, and the nuances are important. And just sort of building uh, a template for yourself. I mean, honestly, so actually I was going to show that tonight. I have a class tonight. And so I was going to show just, it's a go-to. I work in Adobe, one of the programs I work in. Um, I plot charts in Delta Graph, which was uh, a platform that many, many news organizations 
gravitated to a long time ago. Now I have a personal rapport with the developers. Um, they're called Red Rock. They're out of Utah. Um, and I know I've done some videos and some things that they may use for their own marketing because I'm a real big advocate of it. It, it, it slides into the Adobe suite rather okay. easily. So when you so, say like a template or structure, what do you mean? You mean literally like a template, like a design yeah. template or so structure, all, like structure of how you do your work? All of it, oh, okay. all of it. But I'll start out with just a basic uh, frame of folders of assets, uh, uh, sent any files that will be sent and then broken down inside of that JPEGs SVGs, PNGs, because they would go to different people in my case. Because when I do a oh, I, see what you mean. I have to do that once. I can't, you don't want to revisit that. So I build it out in all of its form for all of the places that it has to be all at one time. It's all on deadline. So you're literally saying like a, like, like a file structure on a computer for every project that says these are the things that I'm going to do. So you may have something for data, you may have yeah. for images, you may have your design files, whatever. Yeah. And they're all, oh, that's an interesting idea. So, so what it does is it gives you a clear path to get that idea, which is I call my dream catcher. Hmm. Okay, I actually leave this, yeah, near my bed. If I, sometimes I wake up as we all do, like maybe, you know, in, at night, and I have an idea that just popped into my head because your brain actually solves very complicated uh, problems when the stress drops away right. and your mind is able to. So I tried to have always recorded that. Um, I thought you were going to say you sleep with it under your pillow for a second yeah. when you called it your dream cat. I thought literally you were going to say it's a. Uh... It would go above, but but nearby, just so that I can yeah. capture an idea. And it's something I travel with. Um, it's like people do that with your phone anyway, right? Mm -hmm. This is your dream catcher right here. This is your notebook. Um, embrace it. And so on here, um, there's also, you know, I have a little sketch thing in the event I don't. And so I will draw up my ideas because the next day you won't be able to remember them. Yeah, for sure. That's bad. That said, so adding a structure, fold, like prepared, and then a, some sort of a template that you, whatever program it is you work in, whether it be Excel or, or Tableau or um, m one of many of the programs out there to do, have it all, everything set so that you don't have to be distracted when you do have to develop. Yeah. I don't have it. Where are things? I so that's the easiest way to break concentration, and I probably am very, very highly concentrated when I am working. I mean, I'm not looking at myself when I do that, but you know, it's probably you know I've set over time. I've developed some patterns so that I don't get uh, stray. Yeah, so I think that's that, a good practice, and I'll close out with close out with this. I like that idea because. One, I think we just start throwing things around on a computer because it's so easy to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now we rely on search. We say, oh, I'll just find it by search. But when you have to do things like a handoff, right, and you want to gather, like if, if I'm going to transfer the, the project to you or I need somebody to maybe do some kind of testing or something, whatever that is, if I can have it in a very simple way and pass it on to you, then that's much easier. And also a lot of stuff's done in the cloud. So if everything's just thrown around and someone else needs to access it, it's good to have that structure, whether it's on my local machine or if I'm doing it up in the network somewhere. I think that's a very good practice. And 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 uh, I'm gonna start work, because I know I find, I'm like, where's this, where's this? And then you spend 10 minutes trying to switch yeah. for some file that then you, you get had at your fingertips and drive no. you nuts. Informa oh, like information is inherently difficult anyway. So, you know, you got to provide a, and you know what? All good craftsmen do this. 
whether they be a woodworker and you have your chisel. I mean, you know, you go into their shop, it's organized. Yeah. So by just setting the table in that way, it's going to be really helpful to then solve your problems. And then you use, you know, your own little diagram, but understand the information. Um, what's the message you want to say, right? You got to clearly define that or, you know, maybe somebody having written or, or the researcher who collected the data needs to like, what, what's the point of it? So you need to know that. Yeah. Um, and then what, who's the audience? So if you can solve those three things, if you can, you know, just having those things done oh and goodness. clarified, you can solve anything. So I, I, I just want to summarize a couple of things because we're at our little bit past our 30 minute promise. Uh, so I would say if 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 Ray can sit there on the 43rd floor of the Rockefeller Center after 9-11 and publish a story about nuclear backpacks, we should be able to handle having a conversation when maybe our sales aren't quite as good or, or, or something in the business world. And, and it doesn't take away from the importance of it, but it just means that maybe we're, we're um, giving it too much you know, pressure on ourselves. And it's just something that everybody knows we have to deal with. Get a notebook, get a pen or a pencil for it and, and get yourself organized, create some kind of, you know, uh, a set of st structure where you can collect all of your assets, including your data, any files you're working with, any snapshots, any pictures from your, your notebook, anything like that, I think would make all of our uh, work just that much better. So Ray, thanks so much for one, sharing that very personal story, of course, but uh, for sharing your great ideas. And uh, I'm really glad that we had this chance to to get together online. So stay well and uh, make sure to send a picture of the waterfall with the magic uh, wishing. Yeah. Wish. <laughs> so thanks long, everybody. So See you soon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining.